I'm at a Sydney beach that can be home to patrolling sharks. Anyone who enters the water faces a risk, however small, of being attacked. Science and what we know about sharks influences our personal behaviour, but also our support or opposition for contentious policies like culling. Like the more complex debates around climate change, science is only one of many factors that influence our decisions. We can point to a range of different vectors driving people to see the evidence differently on these complex scientific issues. Some of them are inherent to the issues themselves. We're dealing now with highly complex scientific issues. But I think the idea of immediacy, both in space and time, really does prime people to respond. So we know that we're good at responding to emergencies. When there's a flood, we respond. When there's a global financial crisis, the world mobilises trillions of dollars in response. We're not very good at dealing with something like climate change, which in a way is insidious because temperatures are just creeping up slowly year after year and they're having impacts here in Australia but also around the world. We make decisions based on an emotional calculation about what we value, who we trust and our cultural identity. When we think about these complex scientific issues, it's critical that we think about the role that values play in shaping our decision making. Trusted communicators generate high levels of concern, risk perception and adaptive behaviour. And as with evidence, people trust those who they assume share their values. Psychologist Susan Fisk argues that trustworthiness is a product of warmth and competence. And currently the public view, view science and scientists as competent but alarmingly cold. But once you're in an environment where people understand that positions on an issue are essentially recognizable badges of their identity and their loyalty to a group, and then you're going to see people strangely dividing along the, the, these cultural lines, and the issues are going to kind of clusters in ways that don't make sense, or at least don't seem logical. We can point here to a rise in more partisan media, to strategic misinformation campaigns by vested interests, and the interesting and diffusive role of social media. That's because there's been a deliberate campaign of, of misinformation and of, and of basically outright lies and untruths uh, about climate science and climate scientists. And it's been effective. It's obviously been well funded. It's been well put together. Uh, many parts of the media have, have bought into it. Uh, and so that's actually eroded uh, a lot of the confidence in the scientific community. Vested interests have been actively distorting, confusing and corrupting scientific evidence for years. Vested interests represent a tiny slice of the population, yet have a disproportionate influence, often smothering actual evidence. We've seen vested interests denying the health effects of smoking, the reality of acid rain, the hole in the ozone layer, and more recently, the reality of climate change. And I think one of the big problems is a false application of the so-called balancing principle. Now, on a political question, uh, the media quite appropriately balance one point of view with another point of view. But that's not how science works. I think what also can happen in some media reporting is that scientific fact is put up against what is effectively opinion rather than alternate fact. And the two are equated. And that's not accurate. The um, media often dredge up somebody who has some scientific background somewhere but who's certainly not an expert in the field against an expert in the field as if this is a balanced debate. Just putting that situation in the newspaper or on the air is a huge disservice because it's a huge imbalance. We could simply blame the news media for the current situation but it's important to understand what's shaping their behaviour as well. We're seeing the big papers um, having gotten rid of science staff, science sections. I mean, science journalism has traditionally done their job and it's doing it less and less and less because our traditional infrastructures are just deteriorating. What used to be concerns about journalists maybe confusing balance with objectivity and, and, and giving a voice to, to an opposing side that they shouldn't give a voice to has now shifted to a scenario where there is no opposing side that I'm going to hear ever again. Even if it's an anti-science belief that I hold, I will never get the pro-science side. Now we're at a point where, um, if I don't want to read about baseball, I will never see a single story about baseball in, in an online news environment. It's just not going to happen because I will self-select it out because my friends probably don't like baseball either. Um, and, and because media understand fully that they shouldn't give me these stories. Now, replace baseball with science and you, you see the problem. 
meaning it's easier now than ever before to just read and hear what you already believe. Social media has played a little bit of a disruptive role as well. On one hand, we can recognise that it's collapsed our social and search bubbles so that we only see information that agrees with our current beliefs. On the other hand, it's moved money and investigative powers away from the traditional media so that no one is doing the investigative stories that might stop some of these complex scientific issues from becoming more problematic. One of the big problems in climate change is a great example. A lot of what we've been doing has been intuitive, has been really with good intentions, but not informed. And here's the big irony of science communication has not been informed by science. So our efforts to communicate science have been utterly uninformed by the social science that has been going on about science communication for a long, long time. And I think that explains a large part of where we are today.